So, an Atlantean democracy is one in which every sentient human being attaining their culturally appropriate age of majority has a voice in the government without any restriction. So, for example, the current South African constitution, post-apartheid, with its prohibitions against multiple forms of discrimination, 11 official languages, including state support of sign language for the deaf, 16 more official languages for religious purposes, and support of indigenous languages. This model approaches but not exceed the ideal for conceiving of a contemporary Atlantean democracy. This is a state of affairs which already existed on this continent before white people arrived in great numbers. It existed in Africa before white people arrived in great numbers, and which actually would have included white people as a guest as long as they were well behaved, and many of them were. Native American memories of white people before 1492 were positive. They were expecting, for example, in some uh, Native American nations, the return of the great right, white brother, the, the good white brother who came to them. There was a, the Cherokee have a legend of a person they called the Pale One who came 2,800 years ago, so that's before Christ. And he spoke a, uh, he brought a message of peace. And he said he was going to come back. And so many native nations were waiting for the return of the good white brother. This is why the Ta when the Taino made first contact with uh, Cristobal Colon on Guanahane Island on October 12, 1492, they were bringing gifts because they thought, oh, the good white brother is back. Should examine that a little more closely, brothers. But hey, an Atlantean democracy requires a multiliterate, multilingual polity, such as existed here and in Africa before 1492. So one that is required to know on an individual level thousands of years of history of the peoples of the four directions, that is, the yellow race, the red race, the black race, and the white races, and all their permutations and com combinations. This is required so that no one race can be elevated to an imbalanced position of supremacy over the others, and if such a condition arises, liberatory steps can be taken to rectify such illusory supremacy. So I'm not just interested in eliminating white supremacy, I'm interested in eliminating all forms of supremacy whatsoever. I mean, I was raised not to believe in white supremacy. I barely believe in human supremacy. Sometimes I wish we should give it back to the cockroaches. But I'm alive and I'm a grandpa, so I want my children, my grandchildren to inherit the earth. So, Atlantean civil rights. Civil rights struggle began here on Turtle Island to Lapit on October 12, 1492 not, as it's generally supposed, the mythological historical narrative in the American South in the mid-20th century. Civil rights struggle began here with first contact with a certain group of Europeans. As a result, we've been struggling to regain piecemeal a freedom and a sense of democracy that is native to this soil. Not fabulously, that is, like a story told, imported from the Greeks and the Romans. So democracy did not originate on, with the Greeks and Romans. It was indigenous to this continent and it was indigenous to Africa. African forms of democracy and indigenous Native American forms of democracy basically included every adult human being, regardless of their sexual orientation or the form of their family. No restrictions at all, not just rich white dudes. So I'm not talking about some pie in the sky idea that has never happened. It did happen, it was here for thousands of years. It got removed in the process of becoming America. So, an Atlantean polit politic. Atlanteans <clears throat> did not act as if being monolingually ignorant 
for multiple millennia, all of mul ignorant of multiple millennia old indigenous history was normal behavior. So, for example, the first country to recognize America was a Muslim country, Morocco. It's probably one reason for Jefferson to have a Koran. So, if you did, if you remember in the election that brought Obama to power, there was a state senator or a senator from um, uh, one of these, I forget which state the brother's from, but he took his oath of office on Thomas Jefferson's Koran. So, many people, know, oh, Thomas Jefferson has a Koran? Well, yeah, he does. Did he read it? Probably. Why not? But one of the reasons he might have one is that the first country to recognize the fledgling United States, even before France, was Morocco. So, if Thomas Jefferson possessed a Koran, then he was also aware of the existence of the Iroquois white roots of peace. Even he and his fellow founding fathers, meanwhile, ignored its most crucial tenets. That is, a civilization which does not place women, the bearers of new life, empowered at the center of its civilized concerns, probably will doom itself. Civilization, it could be said, is a collection of structures to protect pregnant women and small children. A society that does not do that will end itself. So whether it's sanitation, indoor plumbing, running water, etc., etc., things that, agriculture, things that are necessary to preserve and protect pregnant women and small children have to be at the center of your civilization. It might be actually okay and a better, good idea, a better idea for women to be able to run the political structure, too. They'll tend to be more practical. That will be in Atlantean politics. You shouldn't be tripping about whether women are in the military. Well, women were warriors here. Women were warriors in Africa. We even had female uh, warriors, and I'm not talking about Xena, but Bodica. So, an Atlantean politic would be egalitarian. Once you place them in the center, they begin to codify the further belief that every human being present is a citizen, therefore a relative, in a greater peace that includes the natural and invisible world. Which of your children or your relatives would you not feed, nurture, or take care of when they're sick, weak, or dying? Which among you should go hungry or homeless while others are fed and sheltered? So the, it is actually dishonorable to have poor people. That's the concept in an Atlantean politic. We don't have poor people. We didn't have poor people until after 1492 when the poor people started coming here <laughs> and create, being created as part of the economic system. Right? To allow poverty is to bring shame upon the nation. At least that was the tradition here in uh, Turtle Island before Western civilization. So, before Western civilization, they constructed a world in which you do not have the freedom to exploit as a private individual, but the responsibility to maintain, to pass on, at least to the seventh generation, hence from today. So actually that line from Iroquois Six Nations about uh, seven generations means as, actually means as long as the waters flow and the grass grows. But that's a little too deep for people, so they said, oh, seven generations. So 140 years, seven generations into the future and 140 years into the past. That is the scope of your decision making. That's what you're supposed to take into account. Uh, at least within the polity of Ir Iroquois Six Nations and many other uh, nations that are, for example, not only building longhouses, but building pyramids. So all this to say, there was civilization here, there was a democracy here, first, right? And so, all, why am I going on this entire bird walk within an African-American class? I'm saying in the Harlem Renaissance, we're looking at coming out of the dark ages of slavery and beginning to build here in America some of the seeds of the civilization that we used to have, that we were ripped away from, and that used to live here, but was destroyed. 
So, a world whose bounty, when reaped in excess of your personal need, either need to be given to those not as fortunate or conserved against future need as in a famine. So, therefore, there shouldn't be poor people among you. And if there are persons in bondage for some reason, then no person shall live a lifetime in bondage, but shall be given access to education and the resources of the community to increase their ability to live in peace and their highest potential in freedom. So, Atlantean politics. Everyone's a citizen. Every citizen has equal rights and equal unlimited access to the means to become powerful. So, example, human sexual diversity, a persistent reality personified by the 4% of human births, that is 4 million people a year. Keep going. Keep going? Okay. Uh, annually would be incorporated fully into society, whether by the seven genders conceptualized by the Osage. So seven genders uh, by the Osage, which means you have five gender roles uh, which are not heterosexual, as we would consider, or the 12 kinds of marriage conceived by the Fon of Dahomey. Gays, so you have gays and women in the military, and you can have uh, gays and women presidents and leaders, uh, political leaders, without comment. Not a big deal. Not an innovation. So a woman or ethnic minority in the White House becomes non-issue, and they're a real, unremarkable possibility. I'm suggesting we won't be civilized until we can do that. And that becomes a reality, without people tripping. So, a black first family in the White House is historic, but, come on, is everybody fed in America? Can everybody get married? Can everybody go to college for free? Any college? Hmm, new. No. So, Africans in pre-colonial Africa constructed complex urban civilizations. Africans in America help construct and contribute to the adolescent American civilization here. Africans in America have been educated to replicate a ghetto rather than a global mentality. And this is one of the things that Douglas is referring to in his painting where he has the architect standing next to a globe. Ghettos you don't have architect necessarily, or you don't have a global perspective. So, global rather than ghetto, that is your true heritage. So we have to aspire not to attain an American dream, but a dream greater than the American dream. Because America is a two-year-old with nukes. Let's be mature. So, ghetto to global. <clears throat> Meme or midrash. So a meme is, if you're not familiar with the term, you can Google it and get n tons of wallpaper. It's the smallest unit of replicating thought. It's like an idea that's a viral idea. Midrash is a term from um, Hebrew. Basically it means, since words in Hebrew can have multiple meanings, a single word can have multiple meanings, Scripture written with words that can have multiple meanings then can legitimately have multiple interpretations. Okay? That might change or mutate according to, your time, according to the time or according to your understanding. Okay? Smallest unit of replicating thought, the concept where the current term viral went. A meme is like a virus of the mind. Like a virus... A meme is inert and is transmitted through any means of human communication. Once in a mind, it replicates, so a meme is like a virus of the mind. So borrowing from genetics, meme is to thought what gene is to DNA. So genetic engineering, mimetic engineering. So mimetic amplification, so there's actually a technique that's used in biology to basically take a strand of DNA and amplify it, replicate it, so that it grows into something more useful than the little itty-bitty strand that you have. Mimetic application is basically doing the same thing. A study of component parts of a means replication so that you can study it to, at, to its logical end. You can look at where it started from, 
how it mutates and then what it's going to grow into in terms of looking at being able to predict unintended consequences. So you notice from day one I said, look, don't just look at your writing and the ideas that you have now. Look at, what, whether you write this down or not, look at where your idea is going to go. What are some of the consequences? Now, what I'm asking you to do is actually what was done in ancient Egypt. There was no technology that was created or considered without looking at the possible impact, good or bad, of the technology. So when Egyptians had the technology for distilled spirits, what we call hard alcohol, that was a state secret that remained a state secret because hard liquor would basically be bad for human beings and their spirit. Sure, they could have made money from it, but they chose not to because they recognized that hard liquor going out into the population was going to be a bad thing. It was going to have a dilatorious effect on the human spirit. So they kept it a state secret. Once they got conquered by the Greeks and then the Romans, that state secret about alcohol got out and you started seeing Europeans, European spiritual orders like uh, the Catholics and the monks, create brandy, create rum, create all these different forms of hard liquor. And then you had people basically giving, for example, rum to four-year-olds, like the Puritans did in the 1600s, giving rum to four-year-olds to put them to sleep. Now, we would consider that child abuse today, but back then they didn't have a concept of addiction. So my idea, the idea is looking at a, tech, the, a technology and looking at its effect, and its moral effect, not just its economic effect. Okay? You don't just re release, you don't do blanket legalization and allow crack co co cocaine to be sold at 7-Eleven. Not a good idea. <laughs> so, mimetic amplification, study of component parts and a means replication. Midrash, personal interpretation of scripture, particularly where the language of the scripture is based on, in this case Hebrew, Jidrash is the same concept in Arabic, already has multiple translations and meanings for single words. So ghetto, <clears throat> Polish or Italian word, depending, for an island where Jews were sent to die or were closed off. Ghetto is also foundry. Italian, after ghetto, island named after Venice, near Venice, where <clears throat> Jews were made to live in the 16th century. Populated by isolated people. Ghetto. Now, part of a city, typically de pop densely populated and run down, inhabited by members of an ethnic group or minority for social, economic, or legal reasons. So, social, economic, and legal are actually inter interrelated. So, if you have a, the basis of an economy that structures in inequality for any reason, but particularly social could be race, Economic, because you're poor, or legal could mean, you know, you broke a law or something like that. So, the idea then of a ghetto is based on inequality, obviously. All kinds of inequality. So, it is not based on what I was referring to as an Atlantean democracy. You have a system of discrimination, and in this case, these are almost always functions of being in a capitalist society. Now, I'm, most faculty here will say, will, will know, I basically am not respectful of socialists or communists. So let's be clear about that. And basically what I mean by that is essentially they don't, necessarily take into history and culture, and they don't examine themselves for racism or other forms of discrimination. That being said, socialists and communists have been the ones more aligned with civil rights movement and equality more than the capitalists. The capitalists need to step up. They ain't. There's nothing in the capitalist model that was initially racist or sexist if you look at Adam Smith, even though he was uh, European, 
and he did have an analysis of, you know, within the wealth of nations. You know, he was basically saying, you know, you need to do wealth is good because you need to help those who are less fortunate than you. There's a moral component in there. Americans basically said that profit is good and it's the only good, and we will profit even at the cost of the social contract or even at the, adva uh, the advantage or to the advantage or disadvantage of other folks. And that also means creating ghettos. And then when you have a concept of real estate, you have prime real estate, which is expensive and not so great real estate, which uh, you can find people to ghettos. That's how ghettos are made. So a situation characterized by isolation, inferior status, bias, restriction, etc. The etymology, from a word for a foundry, to the name of an island, to the place where Jews were forced to live, to its current sense, the word ghetto is a fascinating example of how words can come to mean something entirely different as they travel through time. Hence, my, uh, basically, uh, my use of the term meme. So, ghetto is a meme that changed meanings. So, the word originated from Latin, Jasir, to throw the root of such words such as project, inject, adjective, jet. A Venetian ghetto is a word for a foundry for artillery. As the site of such a foundry, a Venetian island was named ghetto. Later, when Jews were forced to live there because of persecution, the word became synonymous with cramped quarters. So, Jews were forced to live there not simply because of their religion, but also because of their race or their perceived race. People were forced to live in ghettos, who were literate and free. People who were oppressed because of both skin color and religion. Jews in Italy were descended from the original African Edenic people, thus could be swarthy from the Latin word swert, which means dark complected. Even Shakespeare noted the racism in Europe in his time in Othello. How do you have a Moor, in Othello, be a mercenary general for a city-state? So within Othello, basically the principal character is a mercenary general, general for the city of Venice. Shakespeare is writing fiction, but the fiction has to be plausible. The reason he can write about a black general in Europe is because there were black generals in Europe in that time has to be believable fiction more, more than once. Point being, you can thrive in oppression, in a ghetto. You can be proud that you've thrived in, in spite of the oppression. Yes, that's good, but it's still oppression. And you are not thriving as much as in your own optimal environment. So in a ghetto, as Prophet Muhammad, peace be unto him, once said, as quoted by Lupe, Lupe Fiasco, the ink of a scholar is worth far more than the blood of a martyr. It is teachers, doctors, nurses that should be more respected than pimps, gangsters, rappers, and hustlers. And I was, when I was growing up, even though we grew up in what was called the ghetto, there were doctors and lawyers and black professionals living there. They were looked up to. We even actually looked up to the wino because he wasn't always an alcoholic. He became alcoholic because his wife died and his life fell apart. And black people weren't allowed into drug treatment then in the 60s. So everybody gave respect and props to Mr. Jenkins. Not his real name, but I'm saying the wino was respected in our community. So. And that was often one of the issues that I often have with uh, rappers, <clears throat> pimps, gangsters, rappers, and hustlers. You can spit and rhyme, but you can't read and write. You can bust a cap, but you can't do CPR or basic first aid. You can count your money, but you can't do algebra. You know about Al-Qaeda, but you don't know about Al-Mizan, al, al Well, now you do. al is another star. al means literally the follower and what the constellation is follow what the star is following is the Pleiades, the star cluster called the Pleiades, the seven sisters. Though notice those are still in Arabic. 
you could start with learning the language that you speak at all its different levels of complexity. So within this class, because it's called aspiration and it was basically uh, coupled with a writing class, this is where black people are first finding their voice and allowed to have their poetic and creative voice and basically forms the uh, backbone of a lot of the creativity you see today. So you could learn the languages that are both indigenous and imported of those around you. So one of the promises of the then new Obama administration is that it's okay to be smart and black again. To be well read, erudite, recondite, I'm quoting a rapper there, recondite. John Coltrane, a man supreme, he was a wise one. Anyway, a jazz thing. Improvise, make miracles out of mediocrity, mendacity, and madness. Look those words up if you don't know them. To do that, we'll have to do a little aspirational recap. History before 1492, before the year zero. We'll start not with al Kabilan, but Europa, because we're not speaking Kiswahili, we're speaking the English language formatted in the Latin alphabet. So we're doing this because Western civilization is an attempt, or the attempt after the Dark Ages, to recreate the Roman Empire using a weaponized form of Christianity as the glue. Let me say that again. The Romans kill Yeshua. The Greeks called him Jesus. The Romans then, who were pagan at the time that they killed him, later convert to his religion, or a form of his religion, and reformat it for their own purposes, but they still fall. Thus ensues the Dark Ages. Now, Yeshua spoke Aramaic, and Aramaic-speaking Christians took in a principle like the enemy of my enemy is my friend, took refuge among the Persians, who were Zoroastrian. Part of the Persian Empire, the Persians were enemies of the Romans, as well as the Greeks. But what they did with the Christians, the fledgling Christians, is allowed them to stay among them and worship as they chose, and it is among those Christians that the Peshitta, which is the Bible in Aramaic, was written. And then they continued to flourish. So there are Aramaic-speaking Christians today. Not, and the, the feature of Aramaic-speaking Christians is that they, were not, they may have been at the Council of Nicaea, but as part of the African focus with the church at the Council of Nicaea, they basically believe that Yeshua was a master teacher, not a savior. He was a man just like other men, and this is the position of the African church and the Chinese part of the church. So in other words, the non-white parts of the church are saying, Yeshua is a man and we can be like him. And that was his message. But no, the European part of the church is saying, no, he's God's representative on earth, and we, looking like him, are going to basically bring the kingdom of heaven on earth by conquering y'all. So, Council of Nicaea basically saying, basically creating weaponized Christianity. They still fall. And so then Western civilization, during the Dark Ages and coming out of the Dark Ages into the Renaissance, notice the Renaissance in Europe is associated with lots of uh, religiosity, the Catholic Church, etc., etc., creating the university system because we're wearing caps and gowns because we're Catholic monks. So the church was the church and the only form of the church, but in Europe. There were African sections of Christians, there were Chinese sections of Christians that were doing a different thing than these other folks. So Western civilization is the attempt to recreate the Roman Empire using a weaponized form of Christianity as the glue. Now what I say about weaponized is 
Yeshua led no armies in his lifetime. Yeshua never killed anyone in his lifetime. So how do you get Christian soldiers? Where do you get Christian soldiers from? The Romans. Therefore, the Roman Catholic. Christian soldiers and the Crusades. So Aramaic-speaking Christians did not participate in the Crusades. Never did genocide. Never did witch burnings. Never did colonization. Never did any of the things that are associated with the Western side of the church. And they're also distinct from, you know, the Eastern Orthodox sides of the church, too. So, just making a point. The people that speak the language that Yeshua spoke worship Yeshua in the original image that is a non-white person have not been associated with some of the negative things of Christianity. Just saying. Hence, you know, liberation theology. So, America is seen as the pinnacle of Western civilization, at least in terms of power and prowess. So in the time of the Romans... There was no united Europe. Europe didn't exist, essentially, as a, uh, united, the united Europe that we think of today in the European Union sense. They were just warring tribes living regionally. The Roman Empire, for example, at the time of the film that I referenced, the time of Gladiator, united, which essentially nearly a quarter of humanity, but obviously 75% of the planet, had barely even heard of them. They certainly hadn't heard of them here in Turtle Island. The Romans made some incursion into Africa, but didn't conquer Africa either. The Romans, or Italians as we think of them today, still had yet to go to China, Marco Polo, cross the the Turtle Island, Cristobal Colon, definitely not the rest of Asia, Australia, Russia, Hawaii, Polynesia, need I go on. Okay, so there's no united Europe in the time of Romans. Just a bunch of warring tribes. So, Rome who? Rome falls and then begins the so-called Dark Ages. So, Europe. There's an African proverb, the hero is the teller of the tale, which means three things. One, the teller makes themselves out to be the hero, or at least their version of the tale significant. Two, Every telling of the tale, their role in the story gets bigger, and other points of view get left out. Three, so knowing this, you can compensate for the point of view of the teller. I mean, do this even for me. Look, I have biases, I have an agenda. You saw uh, that whole bird walk about Atlantean democracy. Well, I wasn't making up that whole Atlantis thing. That was democracy here. I'm just saying, we got a long way to go to become, (laughs) to return to what we used used to be here. Sankofa, go back and fetch it. Sankofa birds say, all right. Now, the way the story is told, Europeans pulled themselves out of the Dark Ages by themselves. That's from their tale. So, Western civilization, if you go to a dictionary and it defines it, it says Greeks, Romans, that is Greco-Roman, hence Greco-Roman, Europe, holy white, white equals European, European, whites only, and uh, what Bernal talked about, the Aryan model, Aryan as as white itself is actually a fictional construction of white people, Germans. In its original language, Sanskrit, Arya, meant a spiritually pure and selfless person. For example, brahmacharya. That is, that's specifically when you're brahmacharya, you're sexually celibate to keep yourself pure. So, spiritually pure and selfless. Had nothing to do with race in Sanskrit. In fact, you know, in Sanskrit, in India, they're brown people had nothing to do with race, and in fact was from black people in any case. That is, the Dravidians of Indus Kush, also known as India. Ancient Europeans basically thought there were two kinds of black people. 
The ones in Cush, that is Africa, also Ethi another word for Ethiopia. In fact, Ethiopia was also a generic name for Africa. So just because I didn't break this down the other day, Kemet means land of the blacks. Egypt is the Greek word for Kemet, which means land of the blacks. Alkebulan, the, the indigenous name for the continent, land of the blacks. Africa is a Greek word meaning land of the blacks. Ethiopia, land of the people with burnt faces. Do we like determine, do, can you detect a pattern here? All right? So, Kush is Africa. Indus Kush is India. Two kinds of black people. Black people from Kush, Africa, and Indus Kush, India. In fact, you can see this in the movie Gandhi, where the British refer to Gandhi as a nigger. That's a convention within the English language, referring to Indians as niggers. So, you know, sand nigger, prairie nigger. I mean, right, okay, Na Native Americans are prairie niggers. Sand niggers, be anybody from the Middle East that's dark complected. Anyway. The last term we were talking about, the creation of Europe. The ancient model that is racially mixed versus the Aryan, pure white model of Greek civilization. The Greeks basically saw themselves as a racially mixed society because they were going to school with black Africans and so you will see things like in the Odyssey, you remember Circe, the uh, witch on the island changed Odysseus' men into pigs. There are some Greek pottery that depict Circe as a black woman. Medusa as a black woman. Dreadlocks. Snakes as hair. Hmm, dreadlocks. All right, so... The ancient model, which is the Greeks' model themselves, they were racially mixed versus the Aryan pure white, model, pure white model of Greek civilization. So the Aryan model was developed in Germany and basically said that Western civilization was wholly white and the Greeks pulled themselves up into civilization spontaneously without any help from black people. There's a specific reason that they wanted to do that because they were building the foundations of a doctrine of white supremacy, which is constructed on a lie and a myth, but you tell a lie long enough, it becomes truth in some conception. So, the way the tale is told in the traditional canon is the Aryan model of Greek civilization, <coughs> the tale told by Germans in the 18th century, not the Greeks. The Greeks themselves, again, were educated by black Africans. In any case, the foundations of white racial supremacy began to form after the Renaissance. Okay, and the Renaissance came after the Dark Ages. So even though it's people of color, you know, Jews and Muslims and black Christians going into Europe to give them civilizing technology of mathematics, medicine, art and culture, architecture, uh, the foundations of white racial supremacy begin to form after the Renaissance. The Spanish Inquisition, which is basically institutionalization of the doctrine of white supremacy. So, for example, the Spanish Inquisition, let me um, do this in real time. Spanish Inquisition is referred to in Spanish as limpieza de la raza, which equals, translation, purification of the race. They are very clear what they were doing. Okay, so basically it's the Pope in Rome, and there was also a Pope in Spain and the Pope in Portugal, that basically was, okay, 
we're going to, we're coming off of 700 years of conquest by, of the Iberian Peninsula, that is Portugal and Spain by black Africans, and we're going to cleanse the race. So this is like the reconquest of the Visigoths, that is the indigenous European, white European population who had been under military and cultural occupation by black Africans for the second time in history, the first time being in 1050 BC until um, for 150 years, count backward from that to 900 BC roughly. And, um, and then the second time being 700, 711 AD to 1492, note the date. So, Spanish Inquisition. In Spanish, it's referred to as limpieza de la raza, the purification of the race. So they're very clear on what they were doing. They were expelling the Jews, they were expelling the Muslims, and they were expelling black Catholics. So it wasn't about religion, it was about race. They're very clear about that because they were even saying, oh, you people converted out of fear of persecution, so that's not a real conversion. So, because you have Moorish and Jewish blood in your face, so notice that. This is the 15th century. We do not have genetics. We do not have genetic testing. So, if they're saying that you have Moorish or Jewish blood, they're referring directly to skin color. So yes, the Moors, which Moor means black, who are Muslim, the Jews, who are from Africa, there were no European Jews before the 7th century, that means Jews in Spain were probably dark complected and became lighter as they moved up into Europe. Now, of course, we consider Spain part of Europe and certainly the Romans had conquered Spain as well. The Moors who held uh, Spain for 150 years in 1050 BC were driven out by the Romans. So, the reason I'm going through all this history is but this has been blanked out, right? You don't talk about the enslavement, you know, Western civilization doesn't talk about the fact that millions of Europeans were enslaved by black Africans to raise war horses. They don't talk about that. They don't talk about how the standard of beauty being blonde hair and blue eyed was white women from what now is called Russia being sold into slavery to rich black Africans and living in harems. Who has harems? Not white Europeans. Who has harems? Black Africans. Why are they rich? Because they control war horses, they control the spice trade, few other things like that. So white women are captured and sold into slavery, not only by black Africans, but by white people. Millions of them. So not just the sex slaves, as slaves to raise horses. Because the Moors, in order to raise their horses, the horse breed you know of as Arabian, they had to have literate slaves. They had to be able to read and write. Because if you're going to create a quarter horse, you need to know what a quarter is. Which means if we're using a quarter, one quarter, all right? This numbering system is Arabic numbering system. Right? Same culture where we get algebra and al -Qaid. Okay? So, 711 to 1492. Spain is conquered by black Africans. And the Visigoths, who are the indigenous population are trying to reconquer the Iberian Peninsula and they're doing that through various mechanisms including what we call in English the Spanish Inquisition but they refer to in Spanish as limpieza de la raza which the purification of the race. All right. So last term we were talking about the African diaspora and chattel slavery. Chattel means people's property. 
slaves as one race or only brown people that we're talking about in America. But in, back in the day, in the Romans' time, slaves could be any race. Okay? The creation of whiteness in America as policy and the responses of chattel slavery and maroonage and piracy, uh, the explorations, uh, pioneering, colonization, concepts of manifest destiny. Uh, so taking these in turn, the African diaspora, that is uh, people of African descent being scattered all over the world, that's what means di diaspora. Chattel slavery, a form of slavery in which people are property and uh, the condition of slavery is not permanent, is, per is permanent, because the model of African slavery when they're enslaving Europeans, the slaves could earn their freedom. It wasn't lifelong, it wasn't permanent. Creation of whiteness in America as social and political policy. So that starts in, uh, with uh, Jefferson, among others, in uh, the 16 and 1700s. The responses to chattel slavery, the conditions of maroonage, where you free yourself and fight against the slavers. Piracy was one uh, response to that. The, in the historical record, there is no record of an all-white pirate crew. So unlike the Disney ride, Pirates of the Caribbean, which basically shows only white people, unlike the movies where they at least showed multiracial pirate crews, the movie actually mirrors the actual historical reality. There is nothing in the historical record that suggests there were all white pirate crews. There weren't. So explorations, pioneering, colonization, manifest destiny, uh, concepts of black cowboys, black Indians, and uh, the Oregon experience. So this term, we'll learn about black urban legends, racial code words, African Americans, African American constructs and concepts of cross-cultural navigation, axiology, which is a reprise from last term. Kawaida, also a reprise from last term. Ism dynamics. We'll use the historical past as a lens to see the present and the possible future covering the period between 1877, the end of Reconstruction, and uh, roughly World War II. So to make the invisible visible, the doctrine of white supremacy, not just racism, but the supremacy of white European civilization and social forms renders white people disabled in the ability to recognize equality in non-whites and renders non-whites skepti skeptical about their own equality, let alone skeptical about their own humanity. So the traditional canon was designed to raise one people above all others and justify that as if that's real. And in fact, making that real when in fact that has not necessarily been the historical state of affairs, though the telling of history as you've been raised thus to this point will lead you to that conclusion. So to basically think of racism as either a mental illness or disability uh, is uh, one goal of pointing that out. Now, one of the, the books, as I referred to, that the class was built on that may or may be out of print, he, in his book, um, be, Lerone Bennett, who used to write for Ebony Magazine, in his book, Before the Mayflower, called the period from the 1840s the generation of crisis. Now, a generation is 20 years. So when it's starting from 1840 to 1860, the generation of crisis. So in the generation of crisis, the issue is who is a citizen? Who is a slave? What are the legal, moral, economic, and social costs and implications of slavery? Even if you don't own slaves, even if you are free, even if you're a free white person, you benefit in some way because slaves exist. Nobody's free until we're all free. So even if you don't own slaves, even if you're free, you benefit in some way because slaves exist. So what are the solutions to slavery within this generation of crisis? 
Now, we have been talking about Django and Lincoln, etc., etc. We've seen what the traditional canon throws up within the entertainment and industry in terms of educating people vicariously through movies. You saw two different solutions <laughs> to the question of slavery. So some of the solutions to slavery between 1840 and the 1860s, you know, Lincoln said, oh, let's ship them back to Africa. Actually, black people are saying this themselves. This had been going on. Let's have a back to Africa movement. Let's go back to Africa. Lincoln says, send them to Costa Rica. Oh, well, so that's somewhere not here and warm and sunny. So the Civil War in 1860 to 1865, you know, there was certainly jubilation. We won the war. We're free. But, and we have amendments to the Constitution guaranteeing us citizenship, theoretically, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Right? And then Reconstruction being defined as that time between the end of the Civil War till 1877, you know, which I basically think of as reconstructing better chains. So understand what happens, the nature of oppression. When you have oppression that has been long-standing, they are going to make, in, if they need a condition of freedom to support an economy that supports inequity, they have to create the illusion of you're going to a better life. So in reality, often what happens is you're creating better or less visible change. Chains. So, what's in a name? So when we talk about politically correct, the origin of that, that name, that term, actually came from communist China. The idea is that communist China became, China became communist after several thousand years of feudal, not F-U-T-I-L-E, but F-E-U-D-A-L, rule. So in other words, genetic monarchies. Genetic, you know, kings, queens, or actually it's the emperor. So... When they shifted over from that system to somewhere near the current system, people had to be re-educated from the old feudal model to the new politically correct model, and that's where that term, they had to be re-educated. So, PC, politically correct. PC could also be polite conversation. PC could also be personal conviction. What's in a name? So, for example, Chulipit Wapakisanep, the indigenous name for Turtle Island, the long-reaching land, also Turtle Island. So, if you see the graphic, that's North, Central, and South America. Chulipit Wapakisanep. One land, Turtle Island, many nations, no borders. Oh until America gets created and we get borders. Hmm. America. Here's, uh, what's in a name? So from Turtle Island to America. America. America is after Amerigo Vespucci, an Italian explorer, North and South America. So North and South, you know, North and South America are named after Vespucci. This is a European construct. So what this name does is it divorces any indigenous tradition or name from the continent and in our minds. Nothing happens before 1492. There's no history. Till Columbus discovers America. Nothing happening. Doesn't matter that there were pyramid cities here. Doesn't matter that there was intercontinental trade, international trade, with China and Africa. Oh, no. Nothing happens before white people get here. Right? So, politically correct? Polite conversation, personal conviction. Hmm, what is it? al -Kabulan. Land of the Blacks. So that's a more or less current map of the continent with different flags for different countries. al -Kabulan, Africa. Al-Kabulan and Africa mean the same thing, but to use the Greek name, 
and ignore the indigenous name erases the history and cultural connections. So, what's in a name? Who are the people? So, the indigenous, those identifying with a particular land or environment because they have been there for a thousand generations. So, here's the concept, and it's a fairly ancient one. And that is, the land or the people are the people, and the people are the land. So, it's not really your homeland until you've been there for at least a hundred generations, and that means 2,000 years. Now, if you've been there for a thousand generations or 20,000 years, then it's definitely your land, and your language reflects that. Hence, you know, there are 2,000 languages that are connected with tribal and land groups in Africa, and in, you know, England, in England they speak English, in Italy they speak Italian, in Germany they speak German, in France they speak French. Okay, the land of the people, the people of the land, your language reflects where you're from, and a relationship that's at least 100,000 generations old, but definitely 100 generations. So is anybody, who's going to take the Engl England from the English? Who's going to take France from the French? So one of the things that happens, because of this land is the people and the people of the land connection, when you start referring to a people not by their land base, but by their skin color, you can take their land. Okay, so not Africans, but blacks. Oh, that divorces them from the land, because their black people can be moved anywhere. What happens to the Indians over here on Turtle Island when they're, oh, you're, you're not in India, we can take your land, because you're, you're in the wrong place. What happens to the Palestinians when there's no Palestine? Hmm. Land is the people and the people of the land. So that so much so language is identified with land. So, Yankala, Kalapuya, Dine, Tine, Dakota, Lakota, Hopi, Yoruba, Hawaiian, Taino, Arawak, Chamorro, Samoa, Negar. Humans identified themselves with, by affinity with the spirit of the land and that affinity gave them their language. The strategy then in conquest is to divorce the people's identification with the land by forbidding them their spirituality and their language. What was done to the Irish and Scots was practice for what the English and other Europeans eventually did to Native Americans. But that could only happen once they had an identity as Europeans and a united Europe being organized to not only conquer their own lands and the indigenous people within their own lands, but to spread that conquest across the planet. And that's part of what the Age of Discovery is about. All right? So then, what happens when who are the, pe who are the people happens under conquest? Basically, if you militarily conquer them, forbid them their spirituality and their language, then you start calling them by some other name which does not identify them either with the land or by their spirituality, but by their appearance. Then, for example, he, go to slide, he, Indian, heathen, savage, colored, Negro, Negra, nigger, Afro-American, African-American, nigga. So Africans in America have had a cultural legacy that features millennia old, complex, multiplex urban civilizations who develop a diversity of languages, alphabets, spirituality, religion, sciences, arts, philosophy, centered in the everyday and the universal. And there are many social forms tend, which tended to foster education for all and egalitarian political social forms for others. That's part of their cultural legacy. Their presence in other societies tends to reinforce those efforts when they bond in other situations like here in Native America or also in Europe. So, we'll look at the ABCs of colonization next time. Till then, good.
Go well, stay well. Divide, huh? That's good.